Hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I've just been informed that the Crytek versus Cloud Imperium Games Robert Space Industries Space Citizen lawsuit, no, 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 we mean Star Citizen lawsuit, is uh, has had a response from the plaintiffs. Remember, the defendants filed a motion to dismiss. They said that the there were some things that were misinterpreted in the in the in the agreement, and that we need to look at the agreement. They revealed the agreement that that plaintiff had not revealed, and now the plaintiff has had the chance to respond to those allegations. And their response is just as good as you could imagine, and it doesn't answer anyone's questions. So let's get into it. Here we have in the U U.S. District Court for the Central District of California, Western Division, Crytek versus SIG and RSI, plaintiff's opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss the first amended complaint or claims a relief therein or in the alternative to strike portions of the first amended complaint. Don't you love lawyers? The table of contents is a great place to start. Um, we're going to go over all of this during the thing, but their very basic gist of it is that some of the same things that, that some of you have been saying, uh, the GLA needs to be interpreted differently. Let's look detailed in, in different parts of the GLA. Uh, they interpret the exclusive language a little bit different, and uh, they, they, they continue to make these allegations for trademark and copyright infringement. We're going to talk a little bit about that, too. And there's a whole bunch of cases cited here. I will, somebody can provide a link to the actual document. It's posted several places. I got it from, from a public source. I didn't have to get it off of uh, PACER or a research system. Preliminary statement. Oh, by the way, I also have here next to it, we have the, the license agreement here, um, which if you just let me scroll up for a moment, sorry. We have the license agreement, which we'll be referring to so that we can make sure everybody is on the same page. Defendant's motion seeking dismissal and other relief is without merit, this coming from plaintiff. Rather, that motion is a blatant effort to impose delay and burden on Crytek as it seeks to vindicate its rights under its contract with defendants and its copyrights. Okay, reasonably good fluff start paragraph. The facts here are straightforward. Crytek granted SIG and RSI a license to use Crytek's video game development platform CryEngine. Pursuant to the game license agreement, Crytek agreed to provide technical support and know-how to defendants and licensed CryEngine to defendants at a discounted rate in return for certain promises. But after accepting Crytek's assistance and after raising record-breaking amounts from video game consumers in a crowdfunding campaign, defendants began to break their promises. Defendants promised they would develop Star Citizen with CryEngine and not any other development platform. Defendants are now boasting that they have breached that promise. We got that part. Defendants promised that they would prominently display Crytek's copyright notices and trademarks both within Star Citizen and in any marketing materials for Star Citizen, and they've breached that promise. Even though defendants have licensed Crytek's technology to develop only one game, they later separated Star Citizen's feature Squadron 42 into a standalone game without obtaining a license for two games. Defendants promised to provide Crytek with improvements and bug fixes, and they have not provided those. Defendants promised that they would maintain confidenti confidentiality, and they have not maintained that. Defendants say that this action should never have been filed. Only, If only they had kept their promises, the action would never have been filed. But now that Crytek seeks to enforce its contractual rights and copyrights, defendants deny having any enforceable obligation to Crytek and move the court to dismiss Crytek's claims in their entirety. Defendants' arguments simply do not withstand scrutiny and certainly cannot meet the demanding standard required to obtain dismissal as a matter of law. The court should deny defendants' motion and permit Crytek to proceed so that it may vindicate his rights. Summary of argument. Crytek has sufficiently stated for both breach of contract and copyright uh, claims, uh, stated claims for both, defendant's motion to dismiss should be denied. As a preliminary matter, defendants seek dismissal of Crytek's first amended complaint in its entirety, but that complaint alleges numerous breaches of contract and copyright infringement that the motion does not address at all. 
defendants have proffered no basis to dismiss those aspects of Crytek's claims. The arguments that defendants do make are unpersuasive. First, with regard to Crytek's claims for breach of contract, RSI is bound to the GLA for several reasons, including one, RSI is a signatory to at least a part of the GLA, RSI has accepted the contract by its conduct, RSI has is equitably stopped from arguing that it is not bound by the GLA. If RSI is deemed to be bound by the GLA, however, defendants' infringement of Crytek's copyrights is even more persuasive. Defendants claim that their conduct was authorized by the GLA conflicts with the GLA's plain terms, providing that defendants were required to use CryEngine exclusively, were required to promote Crytek by prominently displaying its copyright notices and trademarks, and were licensed to develop only one standalone game, not two. Defendant's contention that the GLA does not permit damages for intentional breaches of its terms, thereby rendering the entire GLA unenforceable and illusory, is contrary to both common sense and the express terms of the GLA. Second, with regard to Crytek's claims for copyright infringement, defendants argue that the GLA author, uh, authorized their use of CryEngine to develop Squadron 42. That is incorrect, because the GLA authorized development of only one game, Star Citizen, not two games. Defendants further argue that having breached the GLA by embedding a different engine in place of CryEngine, they can no longer be held liable for copyright infringement. This argument ignores both the per pervasive copyright infringement that took place before defendants breached the exclusivity requirement of the GLA and Crytek's allegations that defendants' infringement is in fact ongoing. In any event, defendants bear assertion that they are not using any copyrighted work belonging to Crytek presents a disputed factual question that cannot be resolved on a motion to dismiss. So, let me stop here for just a second. They're, they're right about that last part. A motion to dismiss is not the trial, and the, the standard for getting rid of a case on a motion to dismiss is much different, much higher for the defendant than it is during a trial. In this kind of a trial, it's basically a tug of war. Whoever wins 50-50, you know, if I pull you onto my territory, if if you convince the judge that your arguments and testimony are, and evidence are more than are better than mine, then you win at trial, but not here at a motion to dismiss. At a motion to dismiss, you'll see in a moment, um, we'll, we'll cover the one sentence or so simplification of a motion to dismiss standard. But the standard is mostly that the judge has to be able to assume certain facts are true and still fall in favor of the opposing party, of the defending party who has filed a motion to dismiss. So the judge, hearing all of these disputed facts, might say, okay, we're not, we're not ripe for a motion to dismiss at this time. Um, so we'll go to a trial, and either the judge on a bench trial or a jury in a jury trial will decide which facts it believes and which facts it does not. The judge will decide how the law is played out and what law is presented to the jury so that the jury is not manipulated, but a jury would determine whether they believed one party's uh, facts or another party's facts or some mixture of the two. Where, where do we, we read the second part? I forget if we... Uh, I think we read the second part. Or do we get to argument? No, we, we, we were reading this third paragraph. Defendant's motion to strike should also be denied. Defendants seek to strike certain portions of an allegation that sets forth information concerning Ortwin Fryermuth, one of defendant's founders, who negotiated the GLA on defendant's behalf, notwithstanding having previously served as counsel for Crytek. The allegation informs the court that the person who negotiated the GLA on behalf of Crytek is now employed by defendants. All of that information may become relevant if the court were to hold that there are ambiguous portions of the GLA such that a finder of fact must review the negotiations of the GLA to construe it. Okay, this is a different this is a different sentence than what they initially said. Now they're looking for a finder of fact to interpret the contract. Isn't that what I just said? Argument. The motion ignores several of the claims stated. Before we start here, here's the motion to dismiss standard. A plaintiff's complaint must contain sufficient factual matter accepted as true to state a claim that is plausible on its face, legally recognized and plausible on its face. So it's, we're not talking about someone has to win at trial here. We're talking about 
for, for this motion, so the allegations here are what's interesting, right? The motion to dismiss is not what I really care about because what is the judge really going to dismiss this case on a motion to dismiss? Probably not. There, there's definitely some factual disputes here. And so a judge is going to look at factual disputes and probably not rule on a motion to dismiss. But we're all after what's really going on in the background. So I'm curious what the fight is, what the core fight is. I, I want to have the trial now. You know what I mean. We're on YouTube. We're, we're talking about legal education. We're not the jury. We're not affecting the parties. We're not influencing the trial. So we don't have any kind of conflict of interest or anything. We can talk about it. We can play side uh, uh, sideline quarterback and we can uh, and we can play, you know, hindsight's 2020 and all that and look back at these things and judge these parties and have fun with that because that's what we do in the law is is, is try and figure out what the real issue is and then apply the law to those real facts, those, those, those what we believe is the real fact, and make, make a decision from there. So, argument. The motion ignores several of the claims stated. Defendant's motion simply does not address several of Crytek's theories of liability, which precludes dismissal. First, pursuant to Section 7.3 of the GLA, defendants were required to provide Crytek with any bug fixes and optimizations made to CryEngine. This part, I don't think anybody was in dispute. Here is the game license agreement, and it does say in Section 7.3, all the way down here, reverse technology transfer annually, during the game's development period, and again upon publication, licensee shall provide Crytek with bug fixes, optimizations, etc., made to the original source code as a complete compilable version. They're saying that this entitled to Crytek to use bug fixes and optimization internally at Crytek that were found and, and fixed by RSI. Indeed, defendants have publicly claimed they have made extensive optimizations. We stopped taking new builds from Crytek towards the end of 2015. What runs Star Citizen is our heavily uh, modified version of the engine, which we have dubbed Star Engine. Yet defendants repeatedly refuse to substantively provide optimizations or bug fixes, those refusals flouted their obligations, defendants gladly accepted Crytek's technical support and discounted license, but breached their obligation to provide any technical advances back to Crytek. Okay. That sounds like it could be a legit claim. Second, sections 221 and 222 of the GLA require defendants to maintain the confidentiality of Crytex technology, forbidding defendant from publishing or distributing the CryEngine in any way, be it in source code or object code, and that they may not use CryEngine in any manner in which the CryEngine source code or propriety information or third party not authorized. Here, notwithstanding their obligation to provide Crytex valuable software to protect it, defendants repeatedly publicly exposed confidential CryEngine technology, including source code to the general public in a series of bug smashers videos posted online. Okay, so that could be a breach of the GLA if they, uh, I, and I do see that in section 221 over here. except as permitted under the license. License E may not distribute the source code. So it will be up to a judge and a jury to decide whether they're showing their development process was publishing and redistributing the source code within the meaning that was understood to the parties at the time. Remember, we're, we, we're going to be interpreting the minds of the parties at the time that they made this agreement. So there's going to be more than just interpreting the bare... Uh, the bare agreement. If there's an ambiguous term and they can, the judge can't find a a resolution to the ambiguity from within the document, the judge may turn to testimony. It's also possible the judge may say that there's enough in here to resolve it, and the judge may resolve it without turning to testimony. Uh, it, it's th this is about as down the middle as they get. Um, we're gonna con you'll see. We're gonna continue.
Third, although Section 2.6 of the GLA permits defendants to subcontract, that permission is expressly made subject to prior written approval and execution of the necessary non-disclosure agreements. Yet defendants partnered with Faceware without obtaining Crytex approval and provided Faceware access to source code. That could be a breach as well. I think that's what, 2.6? Let's take a look at 2.6. That could be a breach, but now let me also bookend this. When I say breach, what are we talking about? We've reviewed some contract cases recently, and we know that a breach of contract is an economical breach. It's, it's not a moral breach. The judge does not look at a breach of contract as something that requires punishment. And, and, and no judge is going to try and impose maximum damages on a party that breaches a contract except for the maximum contract damages. That would be about it. What are damages under contract? Well, I just said they can't be punitive. They can only really be restorative. And if even then it's possible to get maybe a tripling of damages if there's been some really bad faith and provable bad faith on behalf of the offending party. So, and, and there's the unclean hands doctrine. If both parties have unclean hands, then neither one of them can like accuse the other of being in bad faith or good faith. So there's a lot, there's a really a lot to disputing a contract like this. There's going to be really a crap ton of testimony, um, probably a whole bunch of declarations filed. There might be supporting evidence filed. There's, th th this is going to be a really difficult thing for the parties to to work through. Defendant's motion does not address any of these breaches of the GLA, aside from defendant's generalized arguments concerning remedies sought by Crytek, which are addressed below. For that reason alone, the court should not dismiss. Okay, that's a decent argument. The, um, the plaintiff is saying that because these things were not addressed in the motion to dismiss, that at least these claims survive. And so if at least these claims survive, then you can't dismiss these three claims. But it still has to, it still has to talk about the other claims. It, it, Crytek can't just stop there and say, well, we made a little bit of a motion to dismiss response. They have to make a complete one. The judge could dismiss certain claims and leave others survive, to survive. So Crytek has pleaded claims for breach of contract. To state a claim for breach of contract, Crytek must allege that a contract exists, Crytek performed its obligations, the defendant breached, and those breaches caused damage. And that's, that's pretty much it. Crytek has alleged each and every one of those requirements. Defendants do not contest that a, that a contract exists. Instead, contest that, that RSI is not bound, or no breaches occurred, or that Crytek cannot recover and they assume they will address these below. Both SIG and RSI are bound by the GLA. Defendants argue that Crytek cannot maintain a, cl a claim for breach of contract against SIG's subsidiary RSI because RSI is not a signatory to the main body of the GLA. But the first amended complaint alleges several reasons to conclude that RSI is bound by the GLA. One, RSI is identified as a licensee in Exhibit 4 to the GLA. Although RSI is not listed in the signature block of the main body license agreement, RSI did sign Exhibit 4 as a license E. Sort of. <clears throat> Let's take a look. So if we go all the way down here to the bottom, in fact, I'm going to scroll faster because I don't want to make myself sick. Um, that was Exhibit something else. Hang on. That's Amendment 1. Here we go. This is... Exhibit 4. And I don't know if you remember on the last stream, we kind of skipped this because it said Autodesk on it. And I was like, why do we care about Autodesk's whatever? But at the bottom of the Autodesk part of the license agreement, the end user license agreement regarding Autodesk, it does say, and this is part of the same CryEngine license document, it does say, drumroll please, Cloud Imperium Gaming and Robert Space Industries. It is signed by Chris Roberts. Now, hang on. Before you all get excited, I don't know what the effect this has. I'm not saying one way or the other yet. I don't I don't even know. This is this is a little bit nuts. So you've got 
another agreement attached as part of, and I don't know how it's incorporated into, an existing agreement. This is a different agreement, but it's the same, it's in the same agreement. So which is it? <laughs> so does does that signature apply? Or is Chris, is Chris Roberts going to come back and say, come on, guys, like, I signed, like, I bound... Cloud Imperium and 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 to the terms of Autodesk's of license, like that's that's what he's going to say. So whether I, I really think that's going to come down to the part, the testimony of the parties, and maybe a judge or jury's interpretation. All of this can be avoided if they just work it out outside of court. So. Then it goes on to say, licensee is defined as the individual or entity executing the TOC. Got it. The TOC concludes to be legally bound to the terms of this amendment. Each of the parties has caused to be duly, et cetera. And same thing. It is Chris Roberts signed it. He has the authority to sign it. Defendants? Can, defendants? Defendants cannot be heard to argue that because the TOC is an exhibit rather than a section that the court should disregard it. The main body of the GLA, the parties acknowledge that the exhibits to this agreement form a substantial part. Exhibit 4 further provides that if any provisions of the agreement conflict with any of the provisions of the TOC, the provisions of the TOC prevail. Accordingly, to the extent that the signature block of the main body of the GLA conflicts with the signature block of the TOC, the TOC prevails, making RSI a license agreement, a licensee under the GLA. Interesting interpretation. I think we're going to have to hear both sides on that one. Even construed most favorably to defendants, RSI's execution of the TOC would create a factual issue. There we go. That's what I was getting at. Would create a factual issue to which defendants are parties and... Uh, it could not be resolved on a motion to dismiss. I agree. That part I agree. That was what I was just saying. RSI accepted the terms by its conduct. There is something like this. You, you can accept a contract by your conduct. If the court f concludes that RSI's signature is not enough, Crytek alleges that RSI accepted by its conduct. RSI, not SIG, made the public announcements and published the content cited in the first amended complaint. These announcements and publications include defendants' decision to abandon CryEngine in favor of the GLA. The publication of Crytek's confidential source code in the Bug Smashers video series and the distribution of its software with and without Crytek's copyright notices. So they're saying that because SIG is the licensee and RSI is not, then it that if that was if that was the case, then RSI wouldn't have been making all these announcements. Eh, okay. They could say that RSI is a subsidiary of SIG or something. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. They're definitely both involved, so we're going to hear lots of testimony as to what uh, what 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 the legal relationship really was, and a judge is going to have to apply some kind of law of uh, either agency or corporation law or uh, um, corporate form law to determine exactly what, what, what parties were involved. Most of the time, if the documents don't flesh this out, some testimony will, because these parties will have been conducting negotiations. There will be emails back and forth. There will be phone calls back and forth. There will be declarations from the negotiating attorneys. Uh, Ortwin Fryermuth, I'm sure, will have some things to say. So this is going, this is very quickly becoming a factual dispute. These announcements and publications, including defendant's decision to abandon CryEngine, it is well settled that parties can manifest acceptance by their conduct. And defendants are also equitably stopped from claiming the benefits of the contract while simultaneously attempting to avoid the burdens that the contract imposes. Here, RSI accepted the benefits of the GLA by using and publishing Crytek's technology. Well, okay, the only part the only part I have a problem with then is this next part. I'll read through it first and then tell you what I have a problem with. If RSI is not a party to the GLA, then Crytek's claims for copyright infringement are even stronger. Defendant's suggestion that RSI is not bound by the GLA ignores the implications that that the holding 
or that holding would have for Crytek's claims of copyright infringement. If the court determines that RSI is not bound by the GLA, then RSI was not authorized to obtain Crytek's code. RSI is not included on Exhibit 3 to the GLA, which lists authorized third-party developers who are entitled to receive access to Crytek's technology. If RSI is not a party to the GLA, then SIG had no license to distribute Crytek's technology to RSI and R for Toriari, for Shiari, RSI had, I don't, even, is that, that's, I don't know if that's, if that's how that's spelled. Um, RSI had no license to publish Crytek's source code through Bug Smasher's videos. Okay. So what they're saying here, and this is where I got a problem, they're saying that they have a claim for copyright infringement. If RSI is a part of the agreement, and that they have a stronger claim for copyright infringement if RSI's not part of the, cop the, the GLA. The second part might be true. If RSI is really not a licensee, then they would not have the right to have a copy of and use Crytek to develop anything. However, if, if RSI and SIG are parties to the license agreement, then there is no copyright infringement. There is only breach of contract. I've been through this myself. You don't find copyright infringement and breach of contract in the same judgment, usually. I, I can probably construct a scenario, but the scenario I'm talking about is if party A and party B contract to develop a, a, a music piece, a, a song, and party A wants to own the song and is paying party B for the song, party B writes the song. If the contract says, I'm developing this song as a work for hire for party A, and party A promises to pay me $2,000, and I write the song, and I give it to party A, and party A publishes the song, and I never get the $2,000, do I have a DMCA claim or a copyright claim? No. They own the song. I fulfilled my promise, and I have a claim for contract uh, infringement or contra a breach of contract. If the contract says something, this has to be very specific. If the contract says something like, "This contract is null and void or has no effect until, or the rights don't take effect until the payment is made," or something like that, that specific clause will take effect. So there has to be something in this agreement, which I haven't seen yet, I haven't seen this clause in this agreement, that says that if RSI breaches or if SIG breaches the contract, that it becomes copyright infringement instead of a breach of contract. So I still have a bit of a problem with that claim. Defendants breached the GLA in numerous ways. This is, this is the exclusivity argument. Crytek began assisting the development of Star Citizen at defendants' infancy in 2012 when defendants lacked resources to develop sufficiently impressive software to attract crowdfunding backers. Crytek stepped in to aid defendants creating demonstrations and proofs of concept and otherwise providing technology that enabled defendants to set crowdfunding records. Shortly after defendants launched their crowdfunding campaign, Crytek agreed to license CryEngine to defendants at below market rate and to continue supporting defendants' efforts. In return, defendants promised to develop Star Citizen using CryEngine exclusively. Years later, beginning in December 2016, defendants breached that promise by announcing they intended to use an engine older excuse me, other than CryEngine. Well, again, sort of. They're still using CryEngine, they're just using it inside Lumberjack, which I kind of agree is not the same thing, but we're going to have to hear testimony and argument and, and, and everything on that. Defendants correctly recognize that the whole of the contract is to be taken together when interpreted, yet they wholly disregard that principle relying on two related and false assertions. One, that Crytek's claim is based entirely on isolating the word exclusively, and two, that no other provision of the GLA precluded defendants from abandoning Crytek, or CryEngine. Section 212 grants defendants a license to exclusively embed CryEngine in the game. That grant is subject to strict and continuous compliance with the restrictions of the agreement. 
If there is any doubt that Section 212 prohibits defendants from developing the game with engines other than CryEngine, another section makes it clear. 2.4 says, During the term of the license or any renewals thereof, for a period of two years thereafter, licensee shall not directly or indirectly engage in the business of designing, developing, creating, supporting, maintaining, promoting, or licensing any game engine or middleware which competes with CryEngine. Okay, I, I get that, and that is in section 2.4, <laughs> but let's, let's try to be a little bit fair here, people. You're trying to get us to interpret this Exhibit 4 with its one line of RSI, and then you're coming up here and telling us that, no, 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 wow, we got the wool pulled over your eyes. No, 2.4 is a non-compete clause. It says that, that RSI and SIG aren't going to to sell or support a competing engine. It does not say that they can't use a competing engine, and I would argue that this language, supporting, maintaining, promoting, does not mean they can't promote Star Citizen because it uses an engine different from CryEngine. They're not promoting Star Engine to sell to the customer. They're promoting the game that was created with their engine. So, okay, I get it that you can, like, technically connect A to B to C, I'm not sure that a jury is going to see that as credible. I, I, so I'm open to, to, to hearing more about that. Because again, when we go up here, there's three grants of license. To, to, to exclusively develop the game using CryEngine, to non-exclusively develop CryEngine, and to exclusively develop the game. So those three things taken together seem to support that CryEngine maintains its rights, Star Citizen maintains its rights, even though they are using each other. That's what I believe that means, but that's open to, um, I guess, to your interpretation at this point, because the judge is not going to get to it for a little while. Let's go back. Crytek says this section further confirms there is only one reasonable construction of the GLA that Crytek received exclusivity for Star Citizen in return for the license, tech support, and financial discounts it provided to defendants. That's not what it said. Thus, even if the court were to construe Section 212 to permit defendants to abandon CryEngine in favor of another engine, Crytek respectfully submits that such a construction is inconsistent with the GLA that same abandonment and concomitant development, support, maintenance, promotion, selling, licensing would constitute breaches of 2.4. Again, I disagree. Indeed, defendants promoted an alternative engine in breach of 2.4 in the very RSI press release that defendants themselves submitted with their brief. Defendant's interpretation of the word exclusively is that Crytek gave only defendants, not some unrelated third party, the right to embed CryEngine in defendant's game, Star Citizen. That's absurd. How could CryEngine license a third party to do anything at all with defendant software? Well, you could write it. I think that's the point. The point is that we're making it explicitly clear that I get to that that RSI and SIG get to use CryEngine, but they but that right does not go backwards. CryEngine does not get to use Star Citizen. And I think the other is also true. Star Citizen and RSI get to use CryEngine, but they don't get to have CryEngine. They don't get to sell CryEngine. They don't get to promote CryEngine as their own thing that they developed. I, I, I'm going to need to hear detailed interpretations of those two clauses because my interpretation, we'll go through it in detail, because I just said it. Crytek grants licensee a worldwide license only. Two, non-exclusively develops and support CryEngine. Okay? To exclusively embed CryEngine in the game, which right shall be sublicensable pursuant to 2.6. And 2.6 is where it does say subject to prior written approval, but it also says that approval shall not be unreasonably withheld. So, yeah, I get the ambiguity in the language. This doesn't clarify what that word exclusively means. But it also says they have the right to exclusively manufacture, market, promote, sell, license, and exploit the game in any way. So, I, they can promote the game, but they can't promote the engine that runs the... I don't understand. 
Um, and this, this, is, this is definitely ambiguous language, and so we're probably going to need to look at the typical dealings in the market, specifically video game licensing, video game development licensing. We're going to have to look at what other companies do in, in the market, what these companies typically do, because if it turns out that this line is in every single Crytek contract, and Crytek knows exactly what this line means and is just d interpreting it differently for this case, that's going to come back to haunt Crytek. So there's going to be some discovery of previous contracts that have used a similar clause on both sides, and we're going to find out whether one party or the other really doesn't know what this means. Accordingly, defendants' suggestion that the parties added the word exclusively to prevent Crytek from allowing some third party to develop defendant software is nonsense. No, I don't think that's nonsense at all. I think that if Star Citizen is making improvements to Crytek, they want to make sure that the improvements to Crytek can go back to, to Crytek, but not the improvements to Star Citizen. If they figure out a new algorithm to make the astronaut, you know, the, 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 the walking animation looks better or something more tied to the to the acting animation, you know, that as it was recorded or something. They don't want that to have to go back. So you're you're anyway. Defendants cite cases involving other types of exclusivity, but pointedly do not contend that the GLA prohibits Crytek from licensing CryEngine to other parties. Of course not. It literally says that in the thing. This is the type of exclusivity at issues in cases such as Minden Pictures versus John Wiley describing exclusive licenses where the copyright holder permits the licensee to use the protected material for a specific use and further promises that the same permission will not be given to others. Yes, that's exactly what, how we've interpreted it, that, that Star Citizen has the right to use the material for a specific purpose and that the and Crytek cannot give that right to others. Or that, that, that Star Citizen can't give uh, that right to others e either. This, this, this is the same thing. The copyright holder permits licensee to use protected material for a specific purpose. Nowhere in it does it say the copyright holder requires the licensee to use only their material f when they do that specific purpose. So that does not support their definition of exclusivity. The reading of the GLA most favorable to defendants here that Crytek submits that such a reading is not at all tenable would be that the use of the word exclu exclusively is somehow ambiguous. If that were so, Crytek's claim could not be dismissed because it has now become a factual question. I get it. So yeah, that sounds plausible. I wonder if this... If this uh, response is calculated to respond to the motion to dismiss as opposed to actually answering the the hard questions that we're asking. The GLA is a license for only one game, yet defendants used CryEngine to develop two games. <laughs> this is again a very interesting question. Defendants used CryEngine to develop Star Citizen and Quadrant 42. What, what is a game? Even though Section 212 of the GLA provides defendants a license to embed CryEngine in only one game, the game is, to, is that term defined in 1.6 and Exhibit 2 does not permit CryEngine for any other standalone game. Okay, once again, let me point to this. This same attorney just said we should interpret this Exhibit 4 and the fact that it has... Where is it here? And the fact that it has one reference in the entire, we're at page 30, in the entire agreement, which I don't think is 30 pages long, I think it's less than that. No, the agreement is 25 pages long. So in a 25-page agreement, they're pointing to one instance, where'd it go? Where it says Robert Space Industries, and that's the reason why Robert Space Industries is allowed to be involved, right? But then they say right here that because it doesn't say Squadron 42 in the right place, that Squadron 42 isn't included. So which is it? 
I understand they're two different claims, but they're the same argument. It says Squadron 42 here, and it says Robert Space Industries at the bottom. If one instance of Robert Space Industries is enough, then why isn't one instance of Squadron 42 enough? So this is really going to be a he said, she said, my interpretation versus your interpretation, probably going to have to get some internal documents involved, maybe even get some confidential documents involved so that the judge can see what the parties were discussing when this thing was actually made. This is, um, this is going straight down the middle, about as, as, as straight down the middle as I think I've ever seen one of these things. When the parties negotiated the GLA, Squadron 42 was supposed to be a feature of Star Citizen, not a standalone game. Section 1.6 states that the game is the interactive software product developed and published for certain platforms as further defined in Exhibit 2. Exhibit 2 states, for the avoidance of doubt, the game does not include any content being sold and marketed separately. And being accessed and not being accessed through the Star Citizen game client. The doubt that the parties expressly sought to avoid when they negotiated the GLA is exactly the doubt that defendants seek to manufacture and rely on now. Okay, Exhibit 2 at 18. Let's take a look. There's Exhibit 1. Exhibit 2. Description of the game with platforms. Star Citizen the game. Star Citizen is a destination, not a one-off story. Features. Squadron 42, single player, offline, online, drop in, drop out. For the avoidance of doubt, the game does not any include any content being sold and marketed separately and not being accessed through the Star Citizen game client. Okay. I have not actually seen Star Citizen... And, Star, uh, and Squadron 42 being released as two separate EXEs. Is that what's happening? Could someone, could someone clarify for me? Oh, I'm not in tip staff. That's bad. So, uh, yeah, that's definitely an argument. So they've got an argument that this says that, that Squadron 42 has to be part of Star Citizen or a feature of Star Citizen. But then it does say that, that, that Squadron 42 is part of the game and part of the license. So it would not be copyright infringement. Again, it would not be copyright infringement if Squadron 42 got released as a separate game. It would be a breach of contract. So they really can't have both. They really need to pick and choose which one they want. Um, well, really, they can only have breach of contract, IMHO. The doubt that the, oh, years after the parties entered into the GLA, defendants chose to develop it as a standalone game separate from Star Citizen, but defendants never obtained a license to embed CryEngine in the standalone Squadron 42. Okay, so I'm, I'm being told that there is no Squadron 42 that is separate, so I'm not sure what that is yet. If it is, so they're accusing them of making it separate, but it doesn't appear to be separate yet. Defendants mischaracterize the GLA with their assertions that the GLA expressly defines the game as including both Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Well, I mean, the, the contract does say that. Uh, let's, let's just remind everybody who likes to deny this that it literally says, the game is entitled Space Citizen and its related fighter game Squadron 42. So if the definition of game is under scrutiny, it says both are the game, and it comes down to whether they released it in the improper form or not, and whether that creates some kind of contract damages, and what would those contract damages be? I, it, I don't think, this is not, contract is not a world where if one party breaches, the other party loses everything. That's not how contract works. No, no one here is at risk of losing everything. We're going to get a ruling eventually that says one party owes the other some amount of money. That's it. It might not even be some vast sum of money. It might be a couple million bucks at the most. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly open to being wrong here. Nobody, nobody should ever take my word 
on these cases and things and think that, that I'm speaking as the final anything. I do this for a discussion. It says discussion everywhere. This is a discussion. I think that, that, that this is a very interesting case and both sides have done some interesting things and somebody will probably end up owing someone some money. But, but look, these are... The, the breaches here don't seem to be these huge breaches. It's not like Crytek shipped everything to Star Citizen and Star Citizen then went, screw you, and then released everything and made a billion dollars and never paid uh, Star Citizen or uh, uh, Crytek. It sounds like Crytek got 1.8 million euros, wanted more, and didn't request it but thought that it was getting some kind of exclusivity. Whether or not it really thought about that exclusivity at the time, I don't know. I think that's going to come down to what their internal memos and things said at the time, what RSI and SIG's internal memos said at the time, and one of them's going to be right, one of them's going to be wrong. There could be a genuine dispute over the exclusivity, and the judge might have to just rule in favor of one party based on an interpretation of the contract, and whichever party is disfavored suffers that 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 consequence there was a famous case where there was a multi-billion dollar comma um there was a comma that was out of place it was either forgotten or just the person had it in their head differently than on the page and because of the comma an asset was not included in a purchase and that asset was worth billions of dollars and a judge had to rule on it and that's what happens when your contract is not 100% clear. That's why sometimes it's worth putting the extra time and money into making sure a contract is absolutely rock solid. What I can what I can unequivocally tell you is that both parties did not put enough time into the importance of this contract. Defendants mischaracterized the GLA. The definition of game, singular not plural, set forth in the definitions and section of the GLA utterly refutes defendants' contention that the GLA provided defendants a license to develop two separate games. Defendants urge the court to hold that their recital defines the term game, even though there is an actual definition of that term in the GLA that conflicts with defendants' proposed definition. The GLA is clear, and even if it were not, it is well settled that if a contract's prefatory recitals and the contract provisions themselves are incompatible, the contractual provisions will control. For example, they give an example from Guardia Median, Guardian Media Technologies versus Sears and Roebuck. The court construed a contract where one party contended the prefatory recital should control. The court recognized as California courts routinely proclaim the, long, the law has long distinguished between a covenant which creates legal rights and obligations and a mere recital which a party inserts for his or her own reasons into a contractual instrument. So, well, you might not have noticed, but they said two different things there. They said that the prefatory recitals control, and then they said that a court has said that a mere recital, which a party inserts for her own reasons, does not control. Well, we have to make that, still have to make that connection in this, that that is a prefatory recital that is not that is not at all controlling. So we would have to have a judge's ruling again or, or, or a jury's finding that this was meaningless. So if that's meaningless, then yeah, we ignore it. Then we have to ignore it and we look elsewhere. Of course, that kind of blows Crytek's copyright claims out of the water. So either way, both parties are making some mistakes here. Accordingly, the court refused to allow the recital or any other introductory recital to deracinate the plain meaning of the agreement. Recitals are given limited effect between the parties. Thank you, Blackleaf. Here, the GLA provided defendants with a license to develop only one game with CryEngine. When defendants elected to split the game into two games, each one embedding CryEngine, they should have obtained an appropriate license. And even read most favorably to defendants, a reading that is not at all tenable, defendants would have best identified an ambiguous term in the GLA that would require factual developments to resolve. Yeah, I'm still with that second interpretation. This just requires factual uh, determination. I don't think we can believe either party at this point. 
they're both saying opposite things. They've either both genuinely made these mistakes or one of them is trying to take advantage of the other. I'll, let, I'll leave you to figure that out for yourself. I don't know the parties well enough. The GLA requires defendants to display Crytek's trademark and copyright notices. Pursuant to 281, 282, 283, defendants are required to prominently display Crytek's copyright notices and trademarks in splash credits, documentation, packaging, marketing. Yet defendants cease displaying Crytek's copyright notices and trademarks without seeking Crytek's approval. With so far as to go, uh, we don't call the video game engine CryEngine anymore, we call it Star Engine. Yeah, but I, okay, that's a, that's a public statement that you can use, but I don't know that that statement means what you think it means, Manny Patinkin. Defendants acknowledge that they ceased including Crytex copyright notices and trademarks, but nevertheless assert that they were entitled to cease after they purportedly ceased using CryEngine. Defendants' only support for this proposition is California Civil Code 1655, Concerning implied provisions, that statute, the relevant portion of which defendants, quote, applies only in respect to matters concerning which the contract manifests no contrary intention. This statute, not in application here, section 2.4, which prohibited their switch in the first place, squarely prohibits the promotion of other engines via Star Citizen splash screen, marketing materials, or any other medium. So if, if that's what they're, what they're talking about as far as promotion, I'm willing to hear the argument. Uh, so, but again, which is it? Do you want them to promote your engine or do you not want them to promote your engine? So if they are licensees, then they must be promoting your engine when they are using your engine. But if they are not licensees, then why do they have to be promoting your engine? So if they're claiming that RSI is part of the agreement, then again, it's just a breach of contract. It's not copyright infringement. It's not trademark infringement. It's just a breach of contract. Now, the actual damages might be contract or copyright related, but they aren't going to be the $150,000 per infringement copyright damages. They're going to be provable contract damages. And if Crytek can't prove that they've been significantly damaged, then they won't get significant funds. You can have a breach, a meaningless breach of contract that doesn't have any damage. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I am saying it's a spectrum. We're not talking about shutting down anybody. Crytek's not shutting down, and Star Citizen's not shutting down because of this lawsuit. Defendants assert, and unless the parties spend all their money on it, that's really the only thing. <laughs> Defendants assert that displaying Crytek's copyright notices and trademarks would misrepresent reality and could mislead that SIG is not using Crytek's engine uh, or that it is using it when it's not. But even if defendants were contractually permitted to remove CryEngine from Star Citizen, Crytek's technology would remain foundational to defendant software. Uh, that's a new claim. They moved from a Crytek engine to a Crytek engine. So what do you want? You got paid for Lumberjack, right? We're, there's no accusation in this lawsuit or any other that I know of that says that you didn't get paid for Lumberjack. So if they switch to Lumberjack because their code is compatible with Lumberjack, and they've provided, you know, maybe they provided fixes or something. You could probably accuse them of providing things to Lumberjack that they're not supposed to, maybe. But I don't, I don't know. This is confusing. The pro prohibition on promoting competing game engines or middleware for two years after the expiration of the GLA, along with the contractual right to approve the design of the splash screen, credit screen, documentation, and packaging, forbids defendant from unilaterally removing copyright notices that he did. Again, I want to I want to hear more about this because you could you could read it one of two ways. You could read that they're not allowed to promote another game engine inside of that whole paragraph remember it was para it was two two four i think right let's go down here licensee and its principles for a period of two two years afterwards shall not directly or indirectly engage in the business of designing developing creating supporting maintaining promoting selling licensing any game engine which competes with cry engine 
Ah, I have a difficult time with this one because that says to me that they're not allowed to make or sell their own game engine. In other words, they can't use the the knowledge that they've gained from CryEngine to make their own CryEngine and then promote it and sell it. It doesn't seem to me to be a violation to say we used Lumberjack in this game, but... It certainly could technically cross there and and be a breach, and we'll have to see what the damage is for having a splash screen at the beginning of your game saying which engine you used to create it. Crytek is entitled to damages for defendants' breaches of the GLA. The GLA does not preclude, preclude contract claims for damages does not preclude okay quoting only a portion of section 614 this was the indemnification section where it said there was no there was no remedies defendants suggest that crytek's claim for breach of contract is barred by that section but section 614 as interpreted as a whole does not support that construction the whole of a contract is to be taken together defendants proposal would make other portions of the same section superfluous in particular Section 614 provides that intentional or grossly negligent breaches, as opposed to negligent breaches, can give rise to liability for damages in actions for breach of contract. This section further limits Crytek's liability to defendants even in the event of intentionally or grossly negligent breaches to the amount defendants paid for the license. There is no parallel limitation on defendants' liability to Crytek for defendants' intentionally gross or negligent, uh, intentional or grossly negligent breaches. We went over the section, but th there it is. Um, we can check it. We can go over it again. Defendant's argument addresses only the first sentence of 614, but if the parties could never bring an action for intentional breaches of contract, then the sec second sentence of si 614, which limits Crytek's maximum aggregate liability to the defendants in connection with or in any matter related to this agreement, whether the action is in contract or in tort, would be surplusage. Under defendant's proposed reading, Crytek's maximum liability for contract claims would be zero, not the total amount paid or on behalf of or licensee, whatever, Crytek under this agreement. Defendant's interpretation would also require the court to entertain the dubious assumption that the parties negotiated a detailed 24-page agreement intending that no party could ever actually enforce the agreement. Well, let me just be a little bit frank with you. You did negotiate a detailed 24-page agreement and executed it that's ambiguous as to what game is being created, what the name of the main game is, whether they are separate, whether they exclusively use your license or not, um, and uh, several other deficiencies. So yeah, yeah, I could see a judge being a little bit extra scrutinous of this one since there's been so many mistakes already. Defendants cite a number of cases distinguishing generally between tort and contract law, but none of those cases involve contracts like the GLA that differentiate between the remedies available for intentional and grossly negligent breaches of contract on one hand and negligent breaches on the other. For example, plaintiffs had contracted with the defendant in Ehrlich v. Menenzies, a licensed general contractor, to build a dream house. The contractor did a very bad job on the house. Three decks were in danger of catastrophic collapse. I don't even have one deck. The plaintiffs testified that they suffered emotional distress as a result of the defective condition of the house and the defendant's botched efforts at repair, and the jury awarded them damages for those tortious injuries over and above the sum awarded for breach of contract. The court noted that tort remedies are available for negligent breaches of contract only when the conduct in question is so clear in its deviation from socially useful business, etc. Ehrlich is not applicable here because Crytek does not seek tort remedies for defendants' breaches of contract. Well, yes, they do. Copyright breaches or copyright infringement is often considered an intentional tort. So if you're seeking tort remedies in the form of copyright remedies in a breach of contract situation you might find there to be some limitations. Nor are there any other cases that defendants cite applicable. 
All of them involve plaintiffs who sought tort remedies for contractual breaches, and none of them involve contracts where the parties agreed to permit liability only for intentional or grossly negligent breaches of contract. Here, Crytek does not seek to, re to, to recover tort remedies for defendants' breaches of contract. Rather, uh, Crytek seeks to recover damages for defendants' intentional breaches of contract. The first amended complaint alleges, on numerous instances, intentional breaches that give rise to defendants' liability. Defendants move forward with their plan for Squadron 42, failing to obtain a license. Again, even though it isn't a separate game, I'm really not, I'm really not, I, I'm so confused. Defendants intentionally breached the GLA by using CryEngine to market, develop, and incentivize funding for more than one game. Defendants intentionally breached the, the GLA by refusing to provide agreed-upon bug fixes. Defendants intentionally breached the GLA. Well, the intent still has to be proven. They don't, you don't just get to say it. So we'll have to see what their proof is after testimony and depositions and evidence. Crytek has alleged factual basises for its damages. Basises? Basises. You have multiple basises. Defendants suggest that Crytek's damages are alleged in a conclusory manner that does not sufficiently demonstrate the basis for Crytek's claims. Defendants' misleadingly selective quotations aside, the first amended complaint alleges several specific forms of damages, upfront payment, royalty on game sales that it did not receive when they separated Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Again, I don't know what you're talking about with separated they are run through the same interface, just like you said. It was like your own language. So I'm certainly open to hearing more about it, but you said it. The amount by which Crytek discounted its CryEngine license in return for defendants' now broken promises to include Crytek's trademark and copyright notices in the Star Citizen video game. Uh, agreed that there's some sort of dispute there, but if they did successfully switch licenses or did successfully switch development engines then it would be an equal breach of some sort of copyright or trademark to put them there when they shouldn't be. So you don't get both. I do understand that you want them at the beginning of the game when it's used, but if it's not being used, you can't have it at the beginning of the game. Like that's That would be trademark infringement of itself. The financial benefits of the favorable tension. Good luck proving that. You'll have to prove your actual damages for breach of contract. The value of the bug fixes and optimizations. I don't know. I think that's the most solid. That right there is their most solid claim, is that they didn't get their bug fixes as promised. That I really think they should have received. All the gains, profits, and advantages defendants have obtained by infringing on Crytex copyrights. That's it right there. That's the bullshit one. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it. I don't think that they have committed copyright, at least not based on these facts, especially from Crytek's position. If SIG and RSI have signed this license agreement, then they breached the license agreement and are liable for that, but that does not mean that a breach of license means a breach of copyright. I'm, I'm certainly, again, open to hearing a new argument or a different argument. I'm certainly, uh, do I, do I keep saying something wrong? I, it's Lumberjack, right? Oh, Lumberyard. Lumberyard? Lumberjack. Lumberyard. Oh, God, I'm saying it wrong, aren't I? Oh, jeez. <laughs> all of the, uh, so, so I don't think they're going to get all the gains, profits, advantages that defendants have obtained by infringing copyrights. They might get gains, profits, advantages that are provable from the breach of contract. Crytek sufficiently pleaded its claims for copyright infringement. To plead its claim, Crytek has alleged ownership of valid copyright, copying of constituent elements, where the word copying is shorthand. Yeah, but they've, they've completely forgotten that the Ninth Circuit also has cases that say that contract and copyright do not mix. First, as noted above, the operative complaint includes several allegations of copyright infringement that defendant's motion does not address. These allegations include defendant's infringing publication of Crytek's source code and distribution of the CryEngine to an unauthorized third party. Yeah, so that sounds kind of bad, but at the same time, in the normal course of business, if 
a third party walks into my business and and sees a bit of confidential information in the course of business, I, it might be a breach. I might I'm a lawyer. Like that would be a serious breach sometimes, but it would not be a huge breach if that party was meant to be working on the case. So maybe the judge would admonish me for not disclosing that, and maybe I'd get a slap on the wrist. But I'm a lawyer, and my job involves honesty. Between Crytek and defendants, so they brought in a third-party developer to help them with maybe facial recognition or whatever, just based on its name. I don't, I don't know all about it. Now, we're going to need to hear more. What was the damage? This, this company came in and they copied Crytek's source code and they distributed it to Chinese developers who are now using it for free? Or they came in and used it for its appropriate purpose, developing the video game? So we're going to have to hear more about where the damage is here. Second, defendants reiterate their argument that the GLA authorized them to develop Squadron 42 as a standalone game. It did not. Because Microsoft had a license in another case to incorporate fonts in any operating system or product without limitation, to use its fonts in the product at issue was licensed. However, here, the GLA and the defendants were only allowed to embed CryEngine in one game, not two separate games. The Microsoft case they cite is where someone used the word any to describe the product. That's a very narrow thing to include here. It sounds like they were just trying, that was the hammer and nail problem. They found a case, better include it. Third, defendants assert that having breached the GLA by embedding a different engine in place of CryEngine, they can no longer be held for infringing copyrights. This argument is unpersuasive for two reasons. Even if a court determines that they were permitted to switch engines, defendants' argument fails to account for a full year of infringing conduct. In any event, notwithstanding... Defendants' representation that they no longer use CryEngine in any way, Crytek alleges that the use of CryEngine is ongoing. <laughs> okay. Crytek should be permitted discovery to test the truth of defendants' assertion that they have abandoned the use of CryEngine. Okay, so this is the first time that they're acknowledging that, th that they don't actually know whether defendants are using Lumberyard, Lumberjack, or Crytek. None of the remedies that Crytek seeks are barred. Defendants assert that several forms of remedies are barred. First, defendants reiterate their argument that Section 614 bars Crytek's claim for money damages. Second, defendants argue that Crytek cannot obtain objunctive relief. They rely on Section 107, where the parties agreed that injunction, injunctive relief would only be available as a remedy for certain breaches. That section does not bar injunctive relief, rather it expressly recognizes that such relief may be appropriate. The only limitation that Section 10.7 imposes on Crytek is that Crytek may not seek to enjoin the publishing or other exploitation of the game. 10.7 does not preclude Crytek from seeking other forms of injunctive relief, such as relief concerning defendants' unauthorized publication and distribution of Crytek's copyrighted source code. Wow, they are really relying on this one, so I'm going to call it. I think... Um, I think these two, yeah, I totally messed that up, didn't I? I think these two have definitely got a, to do, like a different interpretation of what breach of contract and copyright have, and we're going to have to see whether the judge agrees, because my professional experience, and I have been in court on the contract versus copyright issue, is that it is not a breach of copyright when it is a breach of contract. Defendants also argue that Crytek has not pleaded facts sufficient for the court to impose injunctive relief. Not only is that argument premature when no motion for injunctive relief is pending, it also ignores numerous allegations of irreparable injury. Agreed. I happen to agree with that. Uh, if there hasn't been a motion for that injunctive relief, then there really doesn't need to be any dealing with it quite yet. But it was in the complaint, so I understand keeping it in the, the motion to dismiss the complaint. 
Third, defendants argue that Crytek cannot obtain statutory damages under the Copyright Act because the copyright registration is dated December 11, 2017, after certain acts of infringement commenced. At this stage, it would be premature to foreclose the availability of statutory damages. Um, that's actually a second really good argument. There is a section of the Copyright Act that says you must timely register your copyrights, and timely registration means within, I think, 90 days of publication or within 30 days of discovering infringement. I think December 11th, 2017 would have been a little bit late for them to register their copyright. Let alone, let me drop another bombshell here, we are in the Ninth Circuit, who I think is one of the uh, circuits that has said that copyright registrations must be approved. We'll have to, uh, so uh, let me let me take a step back here. There's a circuit split in the country right now, saying, w determining whether or not, or or fighting over whether a registration application is enough, or whether a registration approval is enough to file a copyright case. So. Crytek may not be allowed to file its case because they just registered their copyright December 11th, 2017. It may be way too late for copyright uh, under statutory damages. They would still have copyright actual damages available to them if copyright applies. Fourth, defendants argue that Crytek cannot obtain punitive damages for breach of contract and copyright infringement Defendants overstate the holdings in the cases. The Ninth Circuit noted that punitive damages are available for breach of contract in limited circumstances. Yeah, they're really, really egregious circumstances. But agreed, this might not be the stage to dismiss their claims. The strike should be denied. Defendants aver that the initial complaint contained a false allegation that was modified by after being confronted. They now strike what they term the immaterial, impertinent, scandalous offending allegation of paragraph 15. To avoid burdening itself and the court with wasteful motion practice threatened by defendants, Crytek did delete certain allegations from its pleading. Specifically, Crytek retained its allegation that Friar Muth had confidential information about Crytek's licensing practices due to his prior representation of Crytek in negotiation of similar license agreements with third parties, but removed its allegations that Friar Muth's possession of that information would unfairly advantage defendants, and that Friar Muth never resolved the conflict of interest. Defendants assert that the latter of those allegations was demonstra demonstrably false, given that Mr. Friar Muth had obtained written conflict waivers. Having removed that allegation... In an apparently futile effort to avoid this motion practice, Crytek will refrain from addressing it at length and address it briefly instead. First, the letter in which Friarmuth's firm sought consent to his adverse representation states that Friarmuth's firm received a request to represent Chris Roberts and Cloud Imperium and its various related entities. The letter does not explain that Friarmuth had a personal interest in defending in, in defendants, even though Friarmuth co-founded defendants and thus had a personal financial interest, I'm not sure how much how, what what the what that is. There's nothing about that in the law of conflict of interest. It says that they've received a request and they would like to represent. I don't think it has to say all the details. Second, the letter asserts that Friarmuth's law firm does not believe that there exists any actual or potential conflict of interest. It is unclear how this facially reassuring claim that actual, no actual or potential conflict exists could be true. Well, this conflict check that he's doing here would have to be signed by both parties, so they've conveniently left that out, unless it's not. Third, the letter acknowledges that Firemuth's firm has information or knowledge concerning Crytek that Cloud may consider relevant to their actions and decisions, including information concerning other unrelated transactions, yet it promises that absent consent from the applicable client, we may not and will not disclose such information to another. It is unclear how this disclosure could have been avoided, given Firemuth's personal involvement in both representations. Um, I don't think they get to make those allegations without more. They're just saying that they signed a conflict notice, and now they're walking back on it, like, six years later. 
that's kind of disingenuous. I, I would feel pretty offended as an attorney if I got my client's permission to do a concurrent representation or, uh, you know, a, 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 a make sure that my conflicts were, were checked. And then the client turns around and says, well, we're just going to conveniently forget that we would have had to have signed it, that we had the last six years to make us think about it, and we didn't. So I, I think they're trying to throw Friermuth under the bus here, and this is pretty unclear what they're doing. How about that? I'll use their words. It is unclear why they have to pursue it this way instead of being clearer. Notwithstanding Crytek's amendment of paragraph 15, defendants move the court to strike the two sentences. If the court were to hold that the GLA were ambiguous, which Crytek expressly denies any ambiguous provision, really? Crytek denies that you've got ambiguity? Like, again, let's, let's go back and look at this. This is the same company that says that because we have RSI here at the very, very freaking bottom on the last page of the fourth exhibit about Autodesk terms and conditions, because this is sitting here, because Robert Space Industries is sitting here, that that means Robert Space Industries is a party to this agreement. Okay, if so, then you have to acknowledge that Squadron 42 is sitting right here in the prelim as part of the agreement. But instead, they try to get rid of those things cleverly. So I don't know how fair you feel that is. One of those relevant circumstances is that if Friarmouth represented defendants in adverse representation, which defendants now claim yielded an agreement barring any cause of action for Crytek for its breach, pri that, is that even a sentence? Pri uh, Friarmouth's prior representation of Crytek and possession of Crytek's confidential information concerning its licensing practices is accordingly neither immaterial, n impertinent, nor scandalous. Similarly, should the court be required to consider the factual circumstances of the negotiation, it will be relevant to that inquiry that the negotiators for both sides of the transaction, Friermuth and Jones, are now both associated with defendants, which may introduce bias in any present-day testimony concerning the negotiations. Fair enough that they want to at least have, uh, have it open, but um, the initial complaint is what I'm really... That was not necessary to throw him under the bus and say that he was not, he did not have that conflict resolved because he did have that conflict resolved and you signed it. So don't throw him under the bus. Definitely, I get the idea that if he is the person who negotiated the contract on behalf of Crytek six years ago and then he switches and you and you know now you're having a problem now you want to find out what his level of conflict is sure but say that don't say he has a conflict he never got anything signed he's a bad lawyer that right there is probably some kind of uh, libel defamation so they took it out and i don't think he's going to pursue it and they seem to have walked back on it so great so that's interesting um from that, I think that's enough that a judge will probably take this to a, a trial situation, that there will be some kind of discovery. And I have a feeling that these two are going to spend probably about the same amount of money fighting this out as they'll end up owing each other uh, at the end of it, because this, this seems like a lot of petty stuff. I don't know. This doesn't look to me like the most meritorious lawsuit I've ever seen. It seems like there's a some terrible ambiguities in this contract. Why why would you sign a 1.85 million euro contract and have the name of the game wrong on the front of it and later be trying to rely on that document saying this is a perfect document that has no ambiguities in it yet a lot of mistakes. I I don't like it. So there's going to need to be a lot more effort on both parties side to convince the judge and probably to convince a jury and certainly to convince me. So let's see. I've been sent a few things. Is there a stipulation on them not being able to get damages from each other or was that not real? I think we covered that. Uh, Crytek is saying that that does not apply, that that was somehow, that was meant to limit the damages to 1.85 for non-intentional breaches but that uh, intentional breaches, sky's the limit, somehow still apply. 
I, I get it. It. I was equally confused two weeks ago when we read that, and and there was a damage, a no damages clause in in a in a huge contract. So I definitely am open to hearing that there's some other meaning there. <laughs> Skywise is warning me not to uh, to make it clear where, where where I am differentiating my opinion. I try to. I try to. Um, often the text is up on the screen as well, so you can correlate what's what, what what's being read on the screen versus uh, what I'm saying. Is anyone going to get anything with that clause in the contract that nobody can get damages? Uh, yeah, we don't know. Just said that lumber yard, not lumberjack. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that one right. Just like Bill Murray is suing John Oliver, right? Nope, it's uh, it's Bob Murray. And can SIG accuse Crytek of acting in bad faith as they kept important information from the court? Eh, a little bit. I think they did already, and that's a, we, we saw its effect. It's about the only effect it's going to have. The judge will wait for the record to get built up and then make decisions based on their requests, based on the record. It, that's how judges do things. I don't think we're going to see any uh, any other consequence from that. So... That's the show. That's the uh, hour and 23 minutes it took to get through that. That's a complicated, frankly, shit show of a lawsuit that I honestly, um, these guys are going to have to fight it out on the facts. The judge is going to have to decide how to interpret the, the lawsuit, how to, how, to, excuse me, how to interpret the contract. How to, the, 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 the judge is going to have to figure out how to explain the interpretation of the contract to the jury in what we call jury instructions, which are like small bites of, of information. Like, if you find that Crytek had a license agreement with Robert Space Industries for the game, check here, you know, write yes here. If you find that uh, Cloud Imperium Games had a license from Crytek for the game. If you find that the game contained Star Citizen. If you find that the game contained Squadron 42. If you find that the game contained a separate executable for Squadron 42. If you, those sorts of things have to be broken down for the jury, so the jury can can like check off what they find and don't find. And then the jury will have to hear about damages. So not only does a judge or jury get to make a finding on the facts, they then get to make a finding on the damages. And both parties will be able to present their arguments as to how much the damages are. It's only a 1.8 mil contract. So euros, so there's an exchange rate if you're trying to think dollars there. But still, it's not. we're not talking about the 200 million from Star Citizen. And what would CryEngine's licensing fee have been anyway? CryEngine is licensed for many other games, too. So those games would have paid license fees. We'll be able to go back and see, or maybe not we, but defendant here will be able to request in discovery of information the history of other license transactions that were similar to this one and be able to make their own arguments that, you know, maybe... Maybe Crytek was due another million in fees. Maybe they were due another 10 million in fees. I don't know. I, I'm not the video game attorney. I don't l negotiate those things. Um, so I actually don't know what typical licenses are for a game of this size. But either way, this is what they negotiated, and now this is what they have to live with. And they obviously didn't phrase it in all the right ways. And we're going to see why. We're going to see what the interpretation was. Maybe it will involve more allegations against Ortwin Fryermuth. Maybe he will be exonerated and, and this whole thing will be one party's fault. I, I doubt it will be either of those. We're probably going to go somewhere down the middle. It seems to be that kind of a case. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to John from On The Branch Gaming. He donated $1,000 towards this cause to keep me on track. Uh, we needed the money for a car repair. My car is now repaired and running great, and I really appreciate it. I'm going to be going on John's show at some point here. It'll all be announced. Thank you very much for that.
Thank you to my $50 plus supporters, John Steele, Gavin Bernard, The God Slain, Evie, Andy, and Kyle Mudrak. Your support is wonderful and appreciated. The $5 plus supporters are scrolling on my LED panel behind me. Why is this important? Why is support so important? Um, the adpocalypse is hitting news channels pretty hard. Pretty much every video is demonetized. We're making about $20 per video on YouTube. It's pretty terrible. Um, I'm complaining a little bit because we grew this far you having having YouTube's support and then we were just abandoned by YouTube. Fortunately, Patreon is growing. Thank you very much. But the loss of the YouTube income is the same a similar effect. It's just like losing Patreon support or losing any other support. I have to figure out how to make up for that in order to keep the organization growing at the same rate it is. So um I need all of your support. Thank you very much for that, for going to patreon.com slash ljfrench. That's, uh, that's, that's great. We also have an account at sponsus.org. I don't know what the, uh, what the, what the link is there. And, um, and also don't forget that we have a dogs channel. You can go to Such Dogs on YouTube. One of my mods will post a link, please. And, uh, and you can go check out my dog videos. We're getting better and better at them. I'm now using the cinema camera at times to make dog videos. And as soon as it warms up just a tiny bit, I don't do too well in the cold. As soon as it warms up just a little bit, we'll be doing a lot more outdoorsy dog stuff than just uh, playing with ball for 10 minutes while I freeze my butt off. Oh, and here he comes. He's heard me saying the word. He's heard me saying it, so he's come in. Everyone, come on, puppy. Hop. Oh, good boy. Say hi to Nico. So here's your boy, and here's my favorite dog boy. This is Nico. Anybody who doesn't know him, he's my wonderful two-year-old golden retriever. I also have a six-year-old German Shepherd, and... Um, they are mine. They are my pride and joy, and I love them very much. So, Nico, we can see Nico on the Such Dogs channel a lot. I play with them ball, and we go to the dog park, and Doggy Xmas was a particularly popular video. So thank you all for that. And if you are the kind that likes audiobooks, of course, there's Audible. You can go to audibletrial.com slash lawfulmasses, audibletrial.com slash lawfulmasses. There's also a link in the description uh, below. I, I don't know if I remembered to put it into the description of the, the live stream, but we have several links to audiobooks on Amazon and stuff that are pretty fun to read. So feel free to, uh, to help the channel out uh, that way if you'd like as well. Otherwise, that's the end of the stream. I will let you all go and have a good weekend. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I think, uh, I think that's it. I think we got it all. You know what? I do want to thank all the Super Chats. Hang on. Hang on. Before you go, I do want to thank all the Super Chats. Nope, not in an incognito window. That's not going to work. In a regular window. Uh, thank you to Shapcap for the multiple $2 donations. Thank you to Blackleaf. Thank you to Eric Peters. Thank you to 101 Chicken Dance. Thank you to G Name. Thank you to Monkey Bullet. Thank you to Binky. And thank you to DJ69. <laughs> I think I got you all. I'm not going to read the super chats. It's, it's one of those streams, if you know what I mean. So everybody have a good one. I'm going to go uh, do some stuff, and then I'll probably be back later tonight playing some of that Metro. Metro 23, we got to Metropolis, to Polis. So Artyom and, uh, and, his, uh, and his quest are going to continue. And that's on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Leonard French. Love you all. Nico loves you all. And goodbye.